Welcome to the Mix Academy podcast. I'm your host, David Glenn of davidglennrecording.com and of course, the mixacademy.com where for just $1, you can start your 14-day trial. We're mixing records start to finish, leaving no stone unturned. All kinds of content. We've just unlocked the entire back catalog. Three new courses are in the site. Reverb, delay, special effects, hours upon hours upon hours of mixing related content. If you're looking to step up your mixes, there's no better place than the mixacademy.com. We're here today for a special interview. We've got my man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Paul Salveson, otherwise known as Salvo in the industry. And uh, I've known him for a few years. We've had some great conversations over the phone and through social media, but dang it, it was time to pin him down and uh, take some time out of his busy schedule to hang out and uh, and ask some more in-depth questions. And uh, I think you guys are gonna love this interview. We got a ton of stuff to cover. I think it ended up being edited about an hour and a half, over an hour and a half. And uh, we asked all kinds of mixing questions. He guaranteed to come back, so we're going to hold him to that. And then we're looking to uh, to do an online course with him and all kinds of stuff that will be coming your way soon. But I uh, want to uh, wish you well. If you're uh, new here to the Mix Academy, please don't forget to like, subscribe. If you're new to uh, David Glenn Recording, we've got a blog. We've got all kinds of great content for you, free multi-tracks that you can mix and use on your resume. But without further ado, let's get into the interview. Mr. Paul Salveson, otherwise known as Salvo. Enjoy. You know what I forgot to mention? A little sloppy here. Forgive me. We'll we'll clean it up. We'll get things uh, tightened up here. Uh, I'm an audio engineer, a mixer, and uh, hey, we're human too. We make mistakes. My main recording of this interview, uh, the file was corrupt using the program ScreenFlow. Unfortunately, it happens, but luckily, got a backup, right? The backup is uh, not great quality, but it's decent, and uh, my mic was unmuted with my UA Apollo. Uh, so it's got a double recording, little phase kind of thing going on. But uh, if you can look past that, got a lot of great content in this interview for you. And uh, my promise to you, we will look to step this up. This is kind of a trial run for us with the new Mix Academy podcast. If you dig it, please like, subscribe. Don't forget to tell me uh, down below what you, uh, maybe there's some uh, artists, producers, engineers you'd like to see. And uh, we'd love to, uh, to reach out to them and see if we can book them. So now without further ado, let's get into the interview. Thanks again, guys. Well, welcome to the Mix Academy podcast. I'm your host, David Glenn. Got my man, Joey Fernandez, co-host. Joey, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. We Ready have, to go. Yeah, heck yeah. We've got a special treat for you guys out there. Uh, I've been a longtime fan of his work. He's now got six Grammys. Corrected me on that. I thought it was five. It is now six. I want to welcome to the show my man, Paul Salveson. Salvo, how the heck are you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's uh, good to be here with you guys uh, talking. Uh, we already been chatting us some stories, man. It's always fun to get together with engineers, engineers, and talk about stuff because we yeah. usually sit in rooms by ourselves. You know, we I, I think of these like quick questions and whatnot, and kind of lay out a, a show and and things that I want to ask you. And then before we even start, we're rambling. You and Joey's got common connections. I remember when I <laughs> I reach out to you. Dang it, was it Twitter? I think it was. Jeez, it's been four or five years now. And uh, it's crazy how time flies. And uh, I reached out and you're like, hey, let's hop on the phone. And I wanted to pick your brain about mixing and go figure we had other things in common outside. With We both have large families, lots of kids, and uh, lots of different guys. Uh, I saw you like tacos as much as I do. So. Ah, yeah. tacos. <laughs> okay, I got a funny story about that. <laughs> no, I don't know what to tell on here. We'll get, we'll get sidetracked. <laughs> you know, you notice my hashtag tacos on everything yes yeah. story behind that so well, well i'll I tell can't. you after this because it has nothing to do with recording well, <laughs> hey, we're, we're here to learn about you and and uh what you like so uh we'll get to the recording and mixing stuff our followers are mostly aspiring mixing engineers but even in this world today you know who's not a mixing engineer producers guitarists yeah. anybody who's kind of doing their thing is is finding a way which I guess is kind of the root of it all. What, who's, uh, is it uh, Clear Mountain who's kind of quoted as being the first mixing engineer, so to speak? And uh, I was uh, watching some interviews with him and, and some of the stuff with his history and, and got, guys were just kind of becoming mixers as a necessity to, you know, making the music sound better before they released it. And then uh, lo and behold, we have the modern day mixer. So everybody's a music fan here and uh, I've got a whole bunch of music questions from both members in the Mix Academy and myself being a fan of your work. But uh, I want to give people a, a quick rundown. Your, your credits include the likes of, man, all over the place, Little Richard, Israel Houghton, uh, 
uh, Mercy Me, William McDowell, Royal Taylor, James Fortune, Jonathan Nelson, Steve Winwood, Donna Summer, Michael Sweet, and uh, as of late now, Dolly Parton can add to that. Pretty pumped to, uh, to dive in and, and ask you some questions, man. Yeah. Hey, there's something you mentioned there that uh, a lot of people don't realize, um, and, and Joey will testify to this, is becoming a mix engineer, you know, not like you joked about it, like everybody, and, and literally on a Facebook yesterday, somebody asked, hey, I want an, an industry level mix engineer. And then there were all these comments of people suggesting people and and someone was like, I got Pro Tools. That makes me a mix engineer. Da, 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 da. Oh, no. <laughs> what people don't realize up until maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was a process of becoming an engineer, which has been completely wiped out by mm -hmm. technology. Absolutely. Absolutely. You'd be an assistant, and you'd be an assistant for, I don't know, one to a couple of years, depending on how mm -hmm. good you were. Then they would let you record a, a, a vocal. And then if, if you were good enough at that, then they would let you record overdubs or whatever, you know, what was the next step. And then after so many years, they would let you do a tracking session because there was real money on the line. I mean, oh, you're yeah. every person in the room, a thousand bucks a day, you're paying three grand a day for the studio. And so you had to know your shit, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. And the, the gear, the expensive and, gear. And too. I, re, I remember, so uh, it, I was probably 10 years in. I mean, I'd mix little demo stuff on the side and friends and things in, in the 80s, but you really had to have a track record before someone said, hey, I'm going to let you mix a record. Because mixing a record involved, again, renting a studio, a couple grand a day, paying you a grand or whatever a day, and yada, yada. And it really took a uh, concerted effort of me going after, uh, a a actually, the memory, I, I had mixed some other things, but my first real memory was going, talking to Ken Pennell, which in the gospel arena is huge. Is a yeah. cornerstone. And he basically, after seeing me work after years and years uh, of doing things, he let me mix Lionel Harris, I Choose Joy, which was like 92, 93, something like that. And it was a gamble on his part. And um, I knew I was going to do great because I had spent all this time, you know, working on it. So it, people don't, when you talk to people, you don't real they don't realize what the process was becoming a great mixing engineer because you have to know everything about recording before they would even let you mix. Mm. Now it's kind of backwards. I actually yeah. had somebody, um, a friend of mine that uh, did Boys the Men or did a bunch of Orlando stuff yep. in, uh, in, the, in the boy band stuff in the 90s. And I, uh, he found through a course of friends, I started mixing stuff for him. So he finally came to a record where he actually had to record something oh no <laughs> and from the beginning you know he wasn't all programmed and he goes hey man i really like you man i dig, dig your mixing but I, I would like to try using your recording do you know how to record oh no. <laughs> wow <laughs> <laughs> it seems like everybody today starts as a producer right oh, or yeah. a beat maker and labeled producer right. yeah absolutely man Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, no, no, hey. I thought I'd lay some context into what it t takes to be a great mix engineer. You have to, it used to be a process, and now the process is like, it's, it's left to chance. You know, it's hey, all over the place, yeah. And some people get lucky, and they, it turns out good, but um, the next record might not be as good. You know? So I'm, and I'm, I just threw that in there. No, no, no. And in the day, as you know, Paul, if you didn't know how to deal with a tape machine, you were in big trouble. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, you know, you had to line it up, you know, you had to calibrate it. And, and if you didn't know how to do these things, you know, there was a good chance that you weren't going to work on good projects. You had right. to have your stuff together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it almost, and it went into maintenance and other little things as well. So, but yeah, that's what it took. I was going to say, I've, I've wanted to launch something like this for a long time. Joey and I have been big fans of, uh, we'll give a shout out to Dave Pensado and Herb Charwick over at Pensado's Place. I, I learned so much from those guys in the early, early days of that show and uh, I've wanted to kind of venture into the people that, uh, that I followed. I've, I've listened to your records for however long 
for years and even before I knew I was a fan of you specifically as the mixer or, or production and, and mixing and uh, excuse me, engineering in general. Um, I was a fan of your work before I even knew that you were involved in those records. So uh, to, to get a chance to kind of pick your brain and go through it, uh, I had mostly mixing questions, but sounds like we need to do a part two to this interview <laughs> <laughs> recording and, and that kind of stuff. But uh, for those listening, man, can you give us a kind of a background? Why music? Where did it begin for you? Uh, Joey and I, we were all talking about um, your days in Chicago before we went, uh, went live and started recording. But uh, can you just kind of give us a uh, summary of where it all began for you and, and how you got into music? Um, uh, boy, this could be a really long story. But hey, we'll uh, kick back and we're hanging out having fun. Basically, basically you know, in high school um, is when I really got, got into music per se. You'd, I, at, at that time... This would have been the late seventies and um, <clears throat> I am only 30 something, but yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, you'd buy the vinyl and you would put it on the turntable and you would read all the credits. You look at the artwork, who did what. And, um, and I didn't, even though I was a lover of music, I really didn't think about being an engineer or recording or whatever. Um, and, and so I became a, a, lo a lover of music. Everybody says they love music, yeah. but I really got into it in high school and I had kind of a cool little stereo that I put together. But what, what happened was I actually, I graduated, I was a rowdy student in high school and they had a problem with me because I got straight A's and everything, literally oh. <laughs> straight A's, but I was the rowdiest person in high school and I went to a private school and they, um, they said, hey man, why don't you graduate early? You know, they wanted to get rid of me. So they rigged up a way for me to graduate as a junior. And um, I, I, I thought, well, I'll go into computer engineering because that was the next, you know, I could see that that was uh, smart thinking. Yeah. Thing, right. So I went to a, uh, an engineering school in Texas and I absolutely hated it. I didn't realize it was all math. <laughs> and uh, and you're, I was learning Fortran and all these kind, of, you know. And I, I literally like, uh, I, I canceled like half my classes. Started watching soap operas, yada yada, whatever. <laughs> and uh, I came home that summer of '83, uh, and my next door neighbor, his dad had a band uh, called uh, K Ace, and they would play these gigs, and. Um, and it, it just so happened they needed like a sound guy. And so they're, Hey, you, you like sound? Will you, you know, let me, you want to run sound. So they uh, would sneak me into clubs. Cause you know, at the time I was, had just turned 18 and um, you know, you had to be 21 to be in a club. So they sneak me in a club and I would run sound and they would freak out because, you know, I would mix it and then I'd add a little delay in the right places and the verb and, <laughs> And uh, they just loved it. And then they would hand me like a wad of cash at the end of the night. Like, hey. <laughs> oh, nice. So I ended up thinking, hey, I, I, I took a, uh, I ended up taking a recording course uh, out of the College of Lake County. Um, and this dude, uh, he had a studio in the back of his house in Gurney, Illinois, which in Illinois was kind of odd. And he said, hey, yeah, have you ever been down to Nashville? All the studios are in houses and stuff. And I'm like, what? That's weird. Uh, that's crazy. <laughs> so anyways, I took that course, and then I went on to going to the re recording workshop that fall in Chillicothe. And I found out really quickly that most of the people there were just the party. And they, you know, there was a lot of drugs, drinking, all kinds of stuff going on. And so I would, I would kind of barter m money or whatever with uh, the other people there and i would i would say hey could i have your studio time you know i'll give you 50 bucks or whatever to get your studio time so i ended up like taking over all the studio free studio time learning all this stuff and so i left recording workshop uh all i knew to do was to apply to every studio in chicago and uh i ended up i got one interview uh with chicago recording company and um at at that time had the most studios in, in Chicago in under one, you know, well, they had two roofs, but it was CRC 
and Universal, and uh, then there was a close third was Streeterville. So I got an interview, and um, I just kept calling and calling. I was wore them down, and finally they gave me the job. And um, I was the youngest engineer there, assistant engineer there. The next oldest person on staff was 27. So oh, nice. um, within a few months, I be uh, quite a few of them didn't like me because – uh, I had knew I had worked already had worked enough with music that they gave me the music shift, and uh, pretty, a lot of the guys were jealous that I had gotten this music shift. And through that, within a few months, I, I uh, was working with um, you know producers like Phil Bonanno, Mike Jones, and uh, Paul Klingberg, and all these guys that were doing all the Midwest rock and the British rock that was coming to Chicago, and then. Also worked with uh, Tom Tom at the time, Tom Tom 99, who was the Horn Ranger for Phil Collins and Earth, Wind, Fire and all oh, that out of 70s Ohio players. And so I'd end up on these R&B sessions that were in, insane. It would start out with four people at nine, nine, eight or nine o'clock at night. And by midnight, there'd be 60 or 70 people hanging out. So oh, yeah, I learned a lot in those couple years I was Chicago recording because um, I was so young that I didn't really, I wasn't really a partier per se. Uh, so I would always take care of the engineers. They'd pass out and then I'd take over the session. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did really well, uh, in those few years. And so that's basically how I got started. Wow. Holy cow, man. That's, that's hilarious. Amazing. Yeah. I can uh, I can picture a few times where I can relate to that where the other guys would pass out and and then take over. I, and, uh, yeah, Indianapolis kind of went through a little bit of that, but yeah, there was uh, literally uh, one guy who he who I credit uh, Tom. His name was Tom Hansen. I'm not even I, I'm not sure that he's still alive, but he 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 passed. Um, and I, I want to catch a story from with you later, but um, he literally taught me a lot he taught me probably 50 50 60 percent of skills but the funny the, the thing about him was he would be passed out completely by midnight and um so from you know 10 or 12 at night to four or five o'clock in the morning i'd be in charge of the session and these were like major sessions and then i would drive him home on the west side and then I would drive myself back to my house. It would take me two and a half hours to get home because I'd have to drive the west side of Chicago, drop him off, make sure he was okay. Then I would drive back to my house up uh, with the harbor. And then I, you know, next afternoon I'm driving back into the city or taking a train or whatever. So it was a, it was a crazy time, but that's really what forged my skills and, and launched me into the rest of my career. Man, that's great. You, you answered my next question a little bit there. Well, forgive me. What was his name again? The Tom Hansen. Tom yeah. Hansen. Okay. Cause I was going to ask you about any influences or mentors that kind of helped you along the way. Uh, aside from Tom, was there anyone else that, uh, back in that day kind of. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, there was a couple of Fibonano too. I, I got to sit, he actually had his own assistant, but I would, um, come in as a, as a second to the second or, or, you know, an additional help and hang out and, he didn't necessarily interact with me personally, but I would pick up things that he did and other engineers. Also the studio manager at Hank Newberger, at CRC Hank Newberger, was really good at showing us stuff. He was patient. Nice. Uh, I mean, I, 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 at 18 to 20, 21, whatever I was there, um, I was a really a jerk, snot-nosed, you know, little punk kid, and he – he really uh, put up with, put up with me in that time, and, uh, and I have since talked to him a long time ago and apologized for being a jerk. But um, they really put the guys on that team at CRC really poured in, into me. Uh, one of the um, uh, Jim Cogan was another assistant. He mostly did day stuff uh, with like McDonald's and Budweiser and all that those cool. things that were really big in the in the eighties. So those were some. That's really where, where I got rolling on that, that whole team there. Man, that's awesome. Uh, so you're working with all these, uh, these bands. You mentioned Earth, Wind & Fire, and, and uh, when Dave Pensado featured some of their stuff, I went and I, that, that was one my parents didn't pass on to me, but uh, I went and got, uh, got big into them. And 
Uh, I'm curious, what, what's your taste in music? So you've worked with a, you know, a huge variety across multiple yeah. genres. What, uh, what's in your, if you were to go into your car, what's going to start playing on your Bluetooth? Well, doggone it. You would ask me that this week. <laughs> um, that you're not working I mean, on. Uh, it's changed here and there. Um, you know, I always default to Sting and Peter Gabriel nice. and some of the British things like that. Um, I do like pop, some pop. I mean, recently pop is kind of, um, it's, it's almost offensive to me in some ways. <laughs> yeah, I like the sounds of it. Um, uh, I actually, because I just, I, I, I've been in Nashville since 1987, and I literally have done no country music at all. Wow. Um, I don't know. I didn't know the secret handshake or whatever it is to get into. <laughs> um, I mean, I worked with um, two, you know, I, I worked on a Glenn Campbell record uh, once and uh, I worked on Russ Taft's country record. Um, and there was one other one uh, I'm thinking of. And, and, but recently I just started doing some stuff for Dolly Parton and so it led to my curiosity to actually listen to country music because I had never really listened to country music. Okay. And, um, and then basically country music is, you know, older, old country and new country or whatever. So different, yeah. I actually, the last two weeks, the point of you asked me this, I get, if you get in my car, it's a new country station in, in my car. And I've been listening to it because what's, what's funny is I don't know any of it. Oh wow! Kind of wow. Because I'm like actually hearing something I never heard before. But the other funny thing is, it's basically um, old rock. Like it's rock. It's a rock pop thing. It's not. Yep. Country. I, I don't know how they get away with calling it country. <laughs> and I've been listening to that. But the, the, there's seasons where I change. Like there was a season a few, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I was, for some crazy reason, I was mixing a lot of um, rock and indie, indie rock, hard rock um, nice. thing. And I'd, I'd leave the studio and I'd put on classical music because I just had to listen. Uh, I generally listen to opposite of whatever I've been upset. working on or, or whatever. But uh, I always default to stuff that has um, – not so much a genre, but uh, some kind of a groove has space. Um, you know, like a lot of black gospel or R&B stuff that has some kind of a, a groove and there's actually talent, uh, you know, oh, man. people playing um, is what I generally default to. Um, but it, it changes. I don't really, I really am one of those people that really doesn't have something that, um, listens to the same thing because the stuff that I grew up with, I really can't listen to anymore because I've heard it. You know, I, I have friends from high school and not to diss them or anything. They're probably still listening to the same thing they listened to in high school. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't deal with that. You know, I want new stuff. Mix it up. Yeah. I'm always listening to new stuff. I'll scan the charts on iTunes and listen to the top five songs in each genre and, and kind of pick p things that I like about each, each thing, even if it's not a genre I listen to. Yeah. Nice. So that was kind of a crappy answer, but anyway. no, that was, that was that awesome. Was, that, yeah. you, I, you know, not something to elaborate on too much, but the, the old country versus the new, I, I remember we talked on the phone and I mentioned that uh, my mom kind of brought over some of that country influence, but it was old country. It was a Gene Autry and yeah, you know, the older Dolly Parton and uh, George Strait. I remember pure country. Um, my Actually, my youngest cousin, she was named after the, what was it, Harley. Is, she's named after the, the girl in that movie. And uh, uh, I, I swear by the best Christmas music, the only Christmas music I can really tolerate is the classic country stuff yeah, yeah. That, uh, that my mom used to play. But then I'm a huge Keith Urban, Rascal Flatts, the pop rock, like you said, you yeah. know, modern country stuff that uh, now is 808s and, <laughs> and <laughs> Crazy. claps and all kinds of stuff, which, which I like because I, I, you know, I, I do enjoy some of the pop stuff. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, if you like that kind of old country music, did, did, you, did you check out the India Re Christmas record? I did. That was sick. That was incredible. And, and you mixed that, right? Yeah. That. 
that is one in the last couple of years, that's one of the records I'm most proud of. I mean, that it's ridiculous. And we whip it out every Christmas now because it nice. It's timeless, you know, with Joe Sample and her and the, all the friends that she has sing on there. Oh, yeah. All the famous uh, guest appearances. Uh, just just because I think I was talking over you. It's Indy, India Ari. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. So if yeah. you guys haven't checked it out, go uh, go yeah. dig into that yeah, one. Yeah, Christmas with friends. And seeing that they've already got Christmas stuff up at Walmart, you might as well start listening. <laughs> 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 Wow. <laughs> Halloween and everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanksgiving. <laughs> hey, the longer uh, they can capitalize on sales, right? Uh, so this tends to be kind of the Christmas season for, uh, for you with the, the mixing world is you get the Christmas albums in, end of summer or whatever, or yeah. uh, maybe just after this. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I haven't had any this year, which is kind of weird. Um, I don't know what the deal is, but um, yeah, generally you're, well, they liked, you'd like to think they would do them in the spring and summer and be done. But most of the Christmas records that I've done, we're scrambling at the last minute. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. um, in, India, India Ree's record was kind of different because um, when we were mixed, when we, re, we initially started mixing it, um, as soon after I started, Joe Sample passed away. Oh no! So they postponed. Um, I'd have to look at my schedule to see what year it was, but we postponed the record uh, for the release at that Christmas because his funeral was. Um, I don't know. It was right before Thanksgiving, something like that. So we, they postponed the record, and then I started mixing it again in the next spring. And then once people started hearing it, um, they were on her label. People on her label were hearing it. They're like, "Hey." I would like to sing on that. So oh, okay. what's happening is she had Brandy and uh, Michael McDonald and um, Tori Kelly and a bunch of people sing nice. on it because they, they heard how great the record was and they were like, ah, I want to sing on it. So I actually ended up mi mixing that record three times. We actually mm -hmm. mastered it. People heard it. They went back, added vocals, and then I remixed it. And then we mastered it again. So, it's really a great record. It's it that's was, awesome. It was, well, it was yeah. worth. It. Well, it was worth it. It sounded incredible. Yeah, yeah it was. It was um, but I, I tell you what, that's kind of a nice little uh, segue into you. You found yourself a niche with the live albums and yeah. uh, live gospel type stuff. Uh, that's how I first came to know you, and then I'm listening to with my kids are playing Royal Taylor and some other stuff, and so you yeah. kind of made your way into our home in other ways, but. Um, what percentage of your projects nowadays would you say are the live records versus studio? And then do you have a preference either way or do you like to mix it up? No pun intended. Uh, I, I don't have a preference either way. Um, they both have, present their own challenges. Um, what's interesting about that is I did um, Israel's, probably the, the very first breakout record was that new season, which was like 99 or something like that. And that was kind of my first, um that time was kind of my first experience starting to mix live records nice and, and somehow that that record new season had a ground um what do you call it it had roots the following it didn't really bang and hit the streets and everybody loved it it was science thing that slowly grew and then we went and we did another level and and it grew even more so i started mixing more and more live records uh, black gospel and mega churches started doing them. And, um, what really kind of sealed the deal is when we did, uh, alive in South Africa. Oh man. That won a Grammy. That basically was, uh, when that, that's when, you know, kind of the floodgates opened up and, and all these, li I started doing like all kinds of live records. Um, so I, I don't, I like them both. I mean, there's not really there. It's more to me. It's more about the music. I do. I like the music. The music's great. Nice. Fortunately, I very, rarely, very rarely get a record um, that I don't like. And, uh, and, and, and it's been quite a while actually. Um, I remember the last time I fired myself off a record <laughs> probably a couple years ago where it was just, it was just so bad and they were being ridiculous. And then, and I was like, 
I'm sorry. Someone else might be better to mix this record. So. That is the most humble way I've ever heard that put. I fired myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Do that. Hey, and sometimes that's the right, the right call. I, I, I'm sure maybe you can uh, speak to your experience of why you say you fired yourself because I've fought that in the past and just tried and tried and tried to make a couple projects work. I can think of a couple right off the top of my head and uh, I should have just walked away. That's well, yeah, for our followers to, to learn is, from theirs. I mean, The thing is, you're good at what, there's something that you're really great at, right? A niche in your mixing, and you too, Joey, whatever you do. You know what your niche is, right? So go with your niche. Like, so if something is outside of that, like, um, I used to think I had to do everything, and I had to do everything good. And, you know, there are things that I'm not great at. I can't think of any room right now, but anyway. <laughs> there goes the humility out the window. <laughs> uh, I was just a joke. Uh, n- naturally, Norwegians are very humble. Uh, anyway, uh, it, so I, as I've gotten older, I thought, well, I get in these situations where they're like, I want this and I want that and I want that. And, and I'm like, man, this sounds nothing like that. And I don't think I can get it there. And so, um, you know, so then I'm like, I, you know, it might be, might, might be good for someone else to do this, you know? And, yeah. and, and a funny thing is this happened maybe two or three years ago. This, this wasn't a bad situation. This was an interesting situation. So this guy, somebody I didn't know uh, reached out to me and said, Hey, I, w- I would like you to mix this project. And, so I, I, I was talking back and forth. I can't remember if it was Facebook or something like that. And so I said, well, okay, you know, what's your budget? And he had a, it seemed like he had an okay budget. I can't remember. But he, he said, I want it to sound like this and this, and I want it this style. And, and, and I started thinking, like, these are things John Yash mixed. I didn't mix this. John Yash mixed this. So uh, <laughs> I, said, I sent Yash a message. I said, hey, dude, this guy reached out for mixes. And can I give him your email? And he's like, yeah, why are you giving me your email? I'm saying, because everything he likes is stuff you've done. It's not me. And so, um, and so I gave him John's number. And I, I can't, I don't know if it happened or not. The guy might have turned out to be a fruitcake, but. Sure. <laughs> uh, the point is, is like, you, why fight something that isn't you? Like if they, if somebody likes what Yash does, let them go. Go to Yash. Him. Like, uh, it, you know, if they like what I do, then I'll, I'll do it. But you know, there, there was this fantastic situation where it, and it'd be a band, you know, and they were doing a Christmas, they were doing some new record and it, and, and I had mixed them previously mm-hmm. with another producer. And I won't say any names, but they were, it was some kind of urgency of trying to get this record done. It was right before Christmas. And this, they sent me some songs and it just was, it was crap. I mean, it was literally oh. crap. And it was, it was a band that I had worked with before. And um, it was even like, they were like, I only got a couple days into it and I already could tell something's not going to go right here. And I was on the, phone and they were talking about yeah we really want this pinned up in the chorus and and i'm like that's the chorus like literally like the way they had arranged the song i was like the the b section uh was the chorus and the what i thought was the chorus was some other section so this light bulb went into my head and i waited i waited about a half hour and i called the a and r guy and i said dude this might be better if someone else makes it. Oh, no. I'm really not feeling this. This is, this is not good stuff. And, and I, it was a bummer because it was like a good chunk of money. I was turning it down. But it was also Christmas. So I was like, you know, I want to enjoy Christmas. I want to be fighting with these people over Christmas. So I turned down the mix. And um, even though I had spent three or four days on it, and um, – I'm halfway through this story, and I'm wondering, why am I telling this story? <laughs> uh, anyways, well, oh, this is why I'm telling this story. So months later, the guy uh, 
gets either gets let go or something from from the record company and he's no longer a and r and and he, now he's producing himself so he calls me back and goes hey man i really like to produce this live record i'm producing and i'm like cool man that's awesome he goes hey i really respected your decision oh okay to yourself off a record because it wasn't going well and and then uh, later on one of the singers in that band came back and said the same thing I, they're like, I could not believe you did that. That was awesome because it really did suck. <laughs> so if my advice to you, if you find yourself in that situation, just get out because even if you end up finishing the record, they're still going to dog it later, you know, of all the trouble or whatever. Why damage the burned bridges? Yeah, and yeah. I can think of a couple of uh, people we know, mutual people that uh, I'll, I'll take the, the hit as well. I, I didn't handle communication and things like that. I, I learned some life lessons and, uh, and working with some people that, uh, it sounds like I should have said no. I was the yes yeah. man. Yes, yes, yes. And yeah. that bit me in the butt a few times, but, uh, that, that's great advice. I think, uh, yeah. you learn it, something doesn't from ha- it doesn't happen that often. It really does. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It does happen. So especially early in, in earlier in someone's career where they're still trying to figure out the direction and where they want to go. A lot of times you're thinking about getting, wanting to be good at something you're not, and you're also thinking about the money, you know? Yeah, and yeah. And you'll take it for the money, and we've all done The that. kids, I right? I still do it, but um, yeah, so food for thought, that's all it is. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Well, it might be a weird segue. I was, I kept thinking about, um, we were talking about recording, um, there was a specific album I had in mind. I was curious if you did it. I'm, I'm pretty confident Yash didn't do it. For those of you guys listening, uh, John the Yash man, uh, the incredible mixing engineer. Uh, actually, let me let me ask that question. Um, do you ever look to Yash? I, it sounds like you're you know connected, your friends or, or whatnot, or acquaintances. Is that accurate? Do you guys yeah, are- we we don't see each other very often, but when we do, we um, we used to have a good chat. <laughs> I'm curious, is there uh, in the back of your mind, or maybe the two of you, is there like a sense of healthy competition between? Because you guys are right there. I mean, uh, uh, Black Gospel Record comes out. It's did Yash do it or did Salvo do it? For the longest time, is what well, I was thinking. I don't feel it as a competition, but I mean, I ser- I guess if you in the back of my mind, um you you think you want to you always want to do your best and yeah. i don't know if that's you know and you want your best to beat it's, best. Not the, <laughs> it's not the forward in, in, in my thinking as to i'm competing against josh or anything yeah uh, i don't feel it that way at all i really don't um, that being said to, to interrupt respectfully try to can you ever yeah. interrupt respectfully respectfully uh you, you have very different sounds like you you have sounds like he, he's got right. a certain thing and then right. you've got yours and yeah. It's almost like what you said earlier. If somebody wants his sound, you, you pass them exactly. on. Exactly. Why try to why to try the, to fake something that you're you're not doing? You know, just yeah. Force. Um, that really frustrated me a lot in in Christian music. Uh, it still happens, but it seemed like in the '90s that was like uh, every day it was like, hey, let's make this sound like Alanis Morissette. Hey, let's uh, yeah, sound like yada yada. And I was like, oh, gosh, somebody did. <laughs> and I'd have so many arguments, you know, and conversations about it. I was, just got tired of it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, I don't feel uh, – generally, we don't feel that com- competition. Recently, there was a, a, a friend of ours, uh, an engineer, passed away, J- Dave Schober, and um, – he's a great guy. We would have lunch and we would compare notes and talk about techniques and things. We would do things and we'd always learn something from each other. Um, and there really, there was a, you know, there's always a little bit of competition, but even if you think he did more classical stuff, more choral stuff, I did, you know, more uh, black gospel, Mm -hmm. uh, pop and, and independent stuff. So we, there is a little bit of competition because you're, you want to brag about whatever you're doing lately, but there's also that thing you get when you talk and, and there was this stupid thing that um, I do. And I told him about it, uh, the way I print stems. And he's like, Holy crap, man, that would completely change my life if I did that. 
And he That's was, awesome. we were like, we should have uh, lunch more often. But anyways, at his funeral, of course, was a lot of musicians and producers and engineers. So there was this, there was this moment where there was like uh, seven or eight of us all engineers look, standing together after the funeral. We're like, hey, yeah, how you doing? Yeah, we're all looking kind of old and da da da. You know, things going. Yeah, I'm still working, and you know, <laughs> and because there's there was more of us, you know, you don't really generally deep get in deep conversation, but there was still somewhat of a camaraderie there. Like, nice. Yeah, we're still doing it. We're 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 keeping at it. So. Um, I don't know what answer to what question that was, but anyway, it was. Yeah, no, I, Hey man, <laughs> sounded good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, just talking about the healthy competition oh, yeah, and yeah. how there's maybe it sounds like there's a sense of that, but not so much in the forefront and how, yeah. uh, more of a camaraderie, which I would say still exists to a degree. Uh, social media makes it easy for people to get kind of pissy with one another, which yeah. sucks. But, uh, at the same time, I, to look on the bright side, there are a lot of, I mean, Joey and I, French, our friendship was built on the, the online, you know, connection. And now we've been friends for, geez, four or five years. And uh, as much as I've learned from him, he's probably learned from me. And, and oh, yeah, boy, absolutely. So. But, uh, well, I've got uh, some questions here moving into specifics about the mixing process. How do you, uh, how do you feel about talking about uh, some of the, the ways you mix things? Oh, yeah. So I, I guess the first one, because we'll segue out of that. Uh, what's that? Nothing. I'm joking. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm curious, since you do so much of the live stuff, do you have any like consistent challenges or things that come your way that you routinely have to address or that you've got good at addressing uh, that are unique to the live recording kind of world? Yeah. Um he, I'll, here's some generalities. I'll, I'll tell you. A yeah. lot, for the most part, um, I very rarely get great audience mics. I mean, even I mean, even some of the biggest records just don't have great audience mics. So sure. I end up really riding the audience where they need to be ridden, and and actually adding, you know, audience. Uh, I have a library. Mm -hmm. yep. of albums of I've took the uh, audiences off and I keep them uh it's really hard um and I'll have a do I'll do a shout out to Armando Fullwood here he's uh he's a owner of a wave digital they do a lot of AV installs and stuff but he runs front of house uh kind of as a hobby okay he really doesn't need to do it for the work but anyways He's awesome because he's been on a few uh, – he'll run front of house sometimes when Danny Duncan is recording on some of these uh, big, larger projects. Nice. And a lot of times, how are the front of house's mix really affects the live recording, especially if you're wanting it to sound live. I yeah. mean, a lot of live records – where they replace everything and then we just kind of have to patch in audience and cheers and stuff like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But however the how the, the front of house is run during the live recording really affects the audience mic. So depending on how that's done, you know, it, it can make or break the record. The other thing on generally in drums, I can repair, um, I very rarely use samples. I've gotten really good at EQing and repairing things that are recorded bad. That's awesome. Um, Cause I, I hate to, I hate to use samples because then the velocities and all those transients things get changed and they're, they, they get a huge difference. Yeah. They get evened out. But the one thing you can't fix and th this actually live and studio is overheads. You can't fix mm -hmm. how they're recorded. Um, and in the live situation, um, you may have, if they put up glass, you know, the plexiglass around it or something, you'll have all this splash back into the overheads um, that you have to deal with, or they'll put them in the wrong place or, you know, they're backwards or out of phase. Oh yeah. Uh, it could be anything like that. Stereo yeah. image snares on the left side. Yep. Yeah. And so you, that's one thing you really can't re repair, but you, you kind of have to make a compromise with all the drums and how you, address that and then as far as on things that are recorded in the studio or whatever 
a lot of, this happens on overheads too is that especially if it's a small room like the trend now uh obviously is if you have a track a lot of the drummers have their own recording room you just send them a track they put their drums on it and it comes yeah. back um a lot of these people have really small rooms like a 10 by 10 or yep. eight by eight or whatever and what happens is you get more snare in the overhead channels than you get of the actual symbols and which drives me crazy because there's <laughs> really no way to fix that yep and again you have you go back to you have to change your whole drum blend to accommodate for that um fault or failure or whatever you want sure. to call it. so uh, back to the live records um just the, the hardest part is really finessing the lead vocal into what you want the live record to sound like mm. that's really the toughest part and a lot of times they'll people will try to fix one or two lines of the lead vocal and then leave the rest live or whatever and and that gets really hard to deal with so if they're actually going to replace it they might as well just replace just the whole the whole thing, thing. yeah you've I agree. Got a, you've got a it, it affects your audience mics. Uh, you can't have the audience mics on if you've replaced the vocals. So it never that, sounds good. Yeah, that, that's, I'm, the major, I'm, that's the major thing about the live record is I've spent doing. hours trying to EQ match the live to the and and yeah. and then recreate the ambience, and it's just, it's just like man, just do the whole. Well, you usually have to dumb down the studio vocal to match the live vocal or do yeah. something crazy. So what I. What I do in that situation is I'll match, I'll use the same exact mic that yeah. they use. And I usually have them handholded in the studio as yeah. well. If you're, yeah, if, you're involved, if you're involved in the project, that's brilliant. Uh, I've never been in, in the ones that get sent to me to mix at least. I, I don't know if Salvo can, yeah. really, I don't know if you're involved in much of the recording. But uh, yeah, that would be, hey, Joey, that would. <laughs> that would you just, know what? It, it's worked sometimes. It's going to do you to get involved. Fixed. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I, in the in the midst of that, uh, you you talked about the overheads and recording them. I'm curious, how do you? Is there kind of a go to technique for recording overheads that uh, um, that you've gained experience in in the past that you like? That maybe uh, those guys watching who are recording and the the drummers. I'm sure we're going to have some followers in the in the black gospel community and whatnot that uh, are recording their own drums or they're setting up live. Is there a way that maybe we can help them help you? on your next mix with maybe some of those guys recording overheads, any uh, tips or techniques for them? Well, you know, the funny thing is this goes back to what we were talking about bef before we even started recording this interview was, is move microphones. Yeah. Um, it's a pain in the, you know what, but yeah. what, when I'm in the studio, <clears throat> I like, I really like, a stereo image. I'm always going for the biggest stereo image you can get on any, anything I'm working on. And, and so when I'm tracking drums, I used to, I used to do an XY and in some situations an XY will work if you have a smaller kit. Um, you know, if you only have like uh, um, kick snare and in one or two toms, sure. like a small jazz kit, kit, XY works really well for that kind of thing. But most of the time people have got a pretty big drum setup. A lot of symbols and everything. And so what I'll do is I'll generally have a overhead mic somewhere in the area of where the hi-hat is. And then an overhead mic to the other side, to the drummer's right perspective. And what you have to do then is go back in the control room and tell the drummer, hey, will you play a groove and then hit all your symbols? And then you kind of have to see as he's hitting the symbols, okay, is it picking up this symbol and that symbol the same as this symbol? And you kind of have to mess around with the mic's yeah. Yeah. situation. And depending on the room, if it's a medium-sized room and you're going for a pretty open sound, you could actually put those microphones in Omni and it will help you out a, a, a lot. Um, nice. I think a lot of younger engineers don't realize that if you can get a microphone in Omni, it will save your butt in a lot of situations. And, you know, putting figure eights and cardioids and all this kind of stuff, you just start getting into in a, lot of, a lot of problems. So um, I actually will watch the drummer, how he's playing, and how it's coming across on the overheads. 
to me, the overheads are really incredible. They're incredibly important to the, dr the overall drugs. Oh, man, yeah. People don't, people don't realize that, that that's where you're going to catch the ghost notes and all those things that are nuances of a drummer are in the overheads. Um, because a lot of the times you're EQing the snare to be a snare. You're EQing the town to be a snick tom. The overheads are the one thing that you that that are capturing all of the drum set, and you want it to sound as natural as possible with a little maybe sizzle on the top. So that that's my biggest tip is watch the drummer. Like move the mics if there's a spot. And I used to be totally against this, but as I'm getting older. I will actually maybe put a third overhead mic up if there's a spot somewhere in the middle where, you know, sometimes there'll be a ride right here in the middle, yeah. or a special crash or something, and I'll put an extra mic up in, in there and, and capture that. But nice. if you really have to watch and listen, watch and listen. Engineer, man, it, it, the big, I mean, that, of, of, in any kind of tracking situation as an engineer, just watch and listen and try to, you know, put two and two together and see what you need. That's the best advice. I mean, there's no formula because every room is different. Every drummer is different. Every drum set is different. And, sure. and you don't always get the same microphones to work with. So yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, got, sorry, go ahead, Joey. No, I was, I was going to say that in gospel also, it seems like a lot of drummers are requesting for the ride mic to be mic separately as well and you have to deal with that too <laughs> yeah 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 Which, it 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 that it, it does help i mean if there's a song and they start whacking the ride and depending exactly. on where the ride it always and it depends where the ride is at you know um and, and then you could put the mic over or under uh just recently exactly. the live recording where we did the the mic under because we had to have this plastic you know the plexiglass around mm. the drum kit and we put a mic under the ride and it worked pretty well i wasn't sure it was going to get the you know the click the pain, yeah the or the sustain all yeah. right it worked really well that's awesome well, I, joey this is a great time to chime in here uh records one of my favorite drummers pretty religiously uh <laughs> calvin rogers up, up there in chicago uh i know you was it the abbey road israel record that you 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 mix that one i can't remember uh, yeah that was love god love people yeah love, okay yeah. Who, who played the drums on that Do you know oh you would ask me right there because yeah. <laughs> it seems like so many of the the gospel drummers take influence from calvin and so it's become to where it's like okay well did yash or salvo mix that and then was it calvin or and then there's you know maybe a handful of uh, forgive my ignorance, not knowing, you know, some of the top ones, but I, I know Calvin that sticks out and I'm a huge fan. So had to do a little shout out and, and throw Joey in the mix because, uh, Calvin Rogers, he sent me some, uh, some private sound samples of, uh, the, uh, just like the, the, the stuff he's worked on and before it comes out, I'm just like blown away at how insane it sounds. So, but, uh, okay, so overheads, we talked about the overheads, and uh, that's huge. And, and actually, what I was really meant to bring up was, uh, before we went live, you, you had a quote, and you talked about uh, moving microphones. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to you. I told you it wouldn't be as, as, uh, as clean and impactful the way that I would bring it up in the interview. But since I didn't record it at the beginning like a doofus, I'm going to ask you, do uh, you remember, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I was one of the first sessions I got to assist on uh, at, at um, Chicago Recording Company was Tommy Shaw's um, first solo record, and we actually did. We demoed. What was crazy is we had demoed all the songs with Tom Hansen, the guy we talked about yep. earlier. And and in my estimation, we probably spent a hundred grand just on the demos of the record. So then they hired. Um, uh, a producer from England who did Asia and Journey, and there was another huge band in the 90s. I'm forgetting. Anyways, he was British. He, he worked at the townhouse in London quite exclusively, but somehow Tommy got him to come to Chicago mm. to produce the record. So they started the record, and um, it just sounded absolutely amazing. And 
I was like, what is this guy doing? You know, I, I can learn from this guy, whatever, whatever it is. And so I would go in there when they weren't, when the, when everybody went home, I would go into the control room and they were on a, a knee, one of the older knees. And I would see all the EQs and they would just barely be touched, like barely moved. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> and they had, um, and I only, I really think they only had a few compressors uh, plugged in, you know, a couple 160s and, and uh, the you know here's a side story. The hardware the point is, is in that in that area in that era. You know uh, you know how when the plug-in for the 1176 came out, everybody's like, "Oh, that's amazing! Amazing compressor!" You know, I, I use bomb, it. bomb factory. <laughs> yeah, uh, in the 80s, uh, at least in our studios, we had uh, 10 or 12 studios. Nobody used the 1160s. 1176s because they sounded like crap. They were so <laughs> noisy. They were so incredibly noisy. Like you would hit the buttons and that kick, 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 you know, whatever. <laughs> Turn the knob and it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was so much noise. So when they came out with the plug in and there was no noise, I'm like, well, of course it's going to sound great. There's no noise. <laughs> I just thought that was the funniest thing in the world. And then you push all the buttons in for the squash, and everybody was, like, so happy. Oh, we got a plug-in. Well, nobody used them in the 80s. So, anyways, side story there. Awesome. So back there, I, would, I would sneak into the control, and I'd see all, look at all the settings, and I'm like, the dude's not doing any EQ. Or, you know, I was like, what the heck? How does this sound so amazing? So uh, the studio manager at the time, Hank Newberger, which, uh, at, you know, he had won a bunch of awards. Anyway, he himself was a great engineer. And I said, um, you know, how, how are they getting these great sounds? I mean, they're not doing the EQ. They're not really doing any tricks or anything. And he goes, well, Paul. <laughs> it, <laughs> That's I was like, Hank. <laughs> it's Hank. <laughs> So, well, Paul, it's British to move the microphone. It's American to EQ. And I was like, wow. And <laughs> I, started, you know. I started paying attention. I would sneak into the, the room when they were actually micing stuff up, and I would pay attention, and they would actually move the microphone on the piano or the drums or whatever they were micing, even the guitars, you know, pulling it in and out from the app or behind the app and the sound would change dramatically. And so that quote always stuck with me. It was like, it's British to move the microphone. It's American. So basically, uh, Americans are lazy and. <laughs> 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 I want to reiterate something guys. Um, listen to what Paul just said, because that is extremely important to not be lazy, move the microphones, and listen. Critical. Yeah. That's a great piece of advice, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so simple, you forget to listen. Like, you get uh, caught up in what a plug-in looks like or a piece of gear looks like or yeah. how, it, you know, you turn you know the problem. The problem is that a lot of people start using plugins as crutches and, you know, we're not listening for phase anymore because the plugin could do it now, uh, right, you know, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no excuse. You know, the ear is the, the final decision and uh, definitely moving mics around makes a huge difference. You got to use the microphones as EQs. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. And, and, and I, there, to kind of go off of that, a lot of people, a lot of young engineers ask me uh, for advice. And what's the most important piece of gear in your studio? It's your speakers because right. it's what you're listening to. They're even more important than an interface or computer or oh, yeah. rack. It's what you listen to every single day is really important. And another thing I, uh, I and this is another piece of advice I've, and I've told young engineers and I don't know how many people have taken me up on this, but a huge thing us older guys that were able to do was mix on a board. And when we mix on a board, you couldn't do all of this routing and subgrouping and like people mm -hmm. subgroup guitars and keyboards and stuff and re-compress and re-cue and 
all this kind of stuff. You couldn't do that on a regular board. So what I tell these young guys, I say, hey, man, save up some money. You know, save up three, four hundred, five hundred dollars Rent a studio with an analog board and try to do a mix with none of that crap. Like literally sit there and listen to what you're doing because um, uh, one of the stories, uh, you were talking about Al Schmidt before we were recording. Mm -hmm. One of the yeah. stories was uh, a friend of mine was, a, uh, Dave Schoberg actually, was a, a friend of Al Schmidt's uh, assistant. And he uh, was sick like a couple of days or had to do something a couple of days. This is years and years ago. And so the, you know, assistant was like, oh man, I, I can get to run the session for, you know, a couple of days. It, it wasn't a, a competitive thing. It was just, he got to be more involved those couple of days. So what happened was, was uh, like the second or third day, the, the assistant engineer was doing a rough mix. Right. And he was like, he got it on the board and, and it wasn't in the box. It was on the board. And so there he's doing all this stuff and he's like, yeah, that sounds really good. You know, and he'd spent a few hours on it. And so later that day, Al comes in and he's like, oh, man, how's how things going? They're like, oh, things went great. Yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So they start playing back the rough mix, right? And they're listening. And while Al's just listening down, he kind of just does a little this. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the assistant admitted it just opened up. Everything was, sounded amazing. And, and it wasn't a plug-in. It was just a matter of changing the balances and moving things around. And it goes right back to what you said. you got to listen to what's going on. you really got to listen. And some with Pro Tools and, and DP and Logic and all that, we end up looking. We end up looking and watching the waveforms and the little things. And, and uh, it would really help just to close your eyes and listen. So. No, that's awesome. And to beat a dead horse, just listen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, it, I think I'm uh, I'm guilty of contributing to this a little bit as well because um, you go to YouTube, you go to online tutorials and things like that, and it's a beautiful thing. YouTube and the way that we can find, you know, we were talking before we started recording. If you you want to learn how to work on your car, save some money, you right. know, it's yeah. oil or the brakes or whatever, or headlights, like I alluded to, um, you can go find that stuff. But, uh, there's doing it and then there's teaching it. And it also opens up the door for so many people to teach before they have experienced it or what am I trying to say here? So, so like for me, my wife, her background's in education. She almost had a PhD before we had our, our youngest. And, uh, so I, I take the responsibility on that for her not having a PhD so <laughs> props and, and bragging and, uh, uh, brag on her. But, um, she, uh, she talks to me all the time about the, uh, it's kind of like uh, love languages with, with relationships. There's also the, the different ways people learn. There's the kinesthetic, the physical touch, the um, auditory, visual, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, the, you, you go online. And so my background, how I learned originally was with an inbox and Hey, here's an acoustic guitar. You put a mic right here and then the, the guy plays. It's an electric guitar. You put a mic in the center or whatever. Yeah. There wasn't as much, you know, move it off access or whatever, or back it up a little bit and, and move and, and this kind of thing. Some of the, the training that I got into early was very like stationary. Like, Hey, you put this here, you do that, you hit record, you get a good level. And it was very like simplistic and basic. It wasn't a lot of feel or use your ears. And so, um, something that, that we're doing at the Mix Academy is to try to take that um, kind of stale instructional stuff and shift it away from, uh, even shift it away from the psychology of the social media. You know, how can you keep someone on your site longer? How can you keep someone engaged in the platform longer and say, hey, here's an article or here's a video on how to do this. Now here are the files, leave the internet and go do it for yourself and listen and go experience it so that it's not just, a stationary, whatever. And then you're, you're stuck into that for, you know, for the longest time I, I put a, it was a stereo mic acoustics and you put it in front of the sound hole and put one on the 12th fret and you tried to make it work later as opposed to taking your ear and going down and listening or holding a mic and putting headphones on and walking around and moving the microphone to get the sound yeah. Yeah. and then, and then moving on from there. But anyways, elaborating more than necessary probably, but well, we're, 
we're all guilty of that because you know in life is just faster and faster and faster and faster and you're oh, yeah. done you're wanting to get the drum sound before everybody gets hungry for lunch or you're wanting you know, <laughs> yeah you're an acoustic guitar player so he can go home to dinner or, you know whatever it, it's always a rush and those things um you know take time it just takes time to do that stuff right and there's no way around it so. and there are there are go-to positions yeah i mean you think like kick drum there's you know the inside mic you know yeah. there, there's certain things that you've done in the past that may work or may not work is kind of what we're talking about here is yeah. is when it could be better than just sticking it where you stuck it last time right. exactly. <laughs> lack yeah. of better terminology there but well dang it i you know man it's been awesome hanging out i want to get into um some stuff with your uh your your mixing process i had a whole segment here called inside the mix i think what we're gonna do because of time i don't want to uh keep you longer than i promised um let's uh i'm gonna move i'm gonna skip that for now i'm gonna ask can we can we invite you back so that we can do like a proper we'll do maybe like an online workshop yeah this is a blast all right, we had a little bathroom break, so I want to interrupt real quick to remind you that the show is going to be brought to you by TheMixAcademy.com, my membership site. We're mixing records from start to finish, rock, pop, gospel, indie singer, songwriter, you name it. If you're looking to step up your recordings, your mixes, your masters, no better place than TheMixAcademy.com. You can start your 14-day trial for one buck, get you in full access. It's not a little teaser. You get full access to the site. Go in, download all the stuff. we got the whole back catalog available now. Go check it out. And then feel free if you enjoy it. We'd love to have you part of the family. And uh, we'll see you soon in themixacademy.com. I think Salvo should be done by now. We'll go back to the interview and we'll see you soon. Thanks again, guys. All right. So we're back after a, a quick bathroom break and uh, we're going to uh, we're gonna do this. I've got a segment that we're going to hold off on. So you guys who are wanting to know kick settings and snare and how do you do this and all that, we're going we're gonna to tease you a little bit. We're going to give you some of that. But we're going to hold off. For, I've got uh, Salvo promise he'll come back and uh, do a workshop with us where we can open up a mix and, and break things down and get really down and dirty with it. But uh, for now, we're going to move on and do some rapid fire questions. Most of these I, I kind of uh, selfishly created, but uh, we got a couple in here from Mix Academy members, and I'm sure Joey's got some as well. I know he had a yeah. question about live mics and proximity, but uh, we're going to kick it off, man. Salvo, you ready for some rapid fire? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Game show style. You got the <laughs> Johnny Carson mic going on. Um, so I, I had a question. Do you ever use references when you mix? Are you ever listening to either stuff you've mixed in the past that people liked or other mixer stuff? Or are you just going off the cuff and, and whatever feels good? Generally, I don't li listen to references. Uh, I, I mean, if someone sends me something very particular that they're looking for, I'll listen to it. But generally, I like to just, when I get a session, I like to put all the faders at zero or whatever and, and listen to it one time down just like that. And then, then nice. subconsciously or whatever, I kind of hear what I want it to sound like. And then I kind of go from there. Just get to work, right? Uh, yeah, I'd rather do that than... Um, I had early on in my career, I had a lot of bad experiences with people that would send me the demo, right? We've all had this happen and they would be in love with the demo. And so then you would be stuck in the parameters of that demo and you couldn't make it sound better than the demo. So I generally, I want to, I want to, I want to have a clean first impression. So if they, nice. even if they send me a ref, I may listen to the, the session uh, down first and then listen to the ref. To, okay. So I can have some kind of object, objectivity. Because for some reason, they've hired me. Yeah. And a lot of times they forget that I'm the expert. You know, they want me to mix it, not their idea of what the mix would be. But Correct. not to sound arrogant, but that, no, that's no. Really what my job is, you know. Yeah. So they, they come to you cause they like your taste. They like what they've heard. And yeah, absolutely. And, and you answered my next question was about the client's rough. Uh, are you, are you interested in their balances? Are you listening to that? Do you ever go back to it for painting positions or anything to, to make sure that what they've been living with you not only blow away, but, but kind of respect anything that they've done there or, or are you just kind well, of, well, you brought out? up an interesting topic. Um, 
Uh, I, I, you know, if they really listen to a ref, I'll listen to it. And it's really hard to glean from it what they're hearing a lot of times. They'll say, mm-hmm. well, listen to the ref. And, you know, I listen to the ref. I'm like, the ref, the ref sounds like crap. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, that's generally my thing. You know, the vocal will be really loud or something, you know, but they're look, they're listening to something inside of the ref, not the mix of the ref. So I'll try to listen to whatever the thing is inside of the ref that they're wanting to hear. But you brought up panning, panning, and you may not want to hear this answer right now, but that is one thing I will fight to death on. Drummer's perspective. Uh, well, and on anything, vocals, oh, okay. guitars, everything, um, that, that and volume are way more important to me than EQ and compression sometimes. And so if someone says, man, I want you to move the panning over to here, I'm like, I'm like, uh, do we really have to do that? <laughs> <laughs> That, oh, that's, I mean, that's if, you, if you told me, hey, man, turn up the guitar 10 dB, I'd be like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> but if you say, hey, change the panning to the other side or whatever, I'll be like, eh, mm, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> because when I'm setting up a mix, everything, everything on the left for me has a counterpart on the right. Mm-hmm. And I really keep 10 to 2 pretty wide open because that's where I want the lead vocal or any kind of lead instrument to be in. And I'll get people send me a session with these crazy pannings. And I'm like, you know, you can't mix like that. Things Mm -hmm. don't gel. Panning is like, it's something, I mean, I guess we should teach a class on it because I, I think people just, like that is so overlooked to me. You know what's funny? I was just yeah. thinking about I was just thinking about that, Paul. I go, somebody so needs to set somebody needs to set the record straight on panning because yeah. uh, I and I don't know that there's any rules about it. Write it down. It certainly is overlooked. Um, so sorry, I over answered. Oh no, 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 but that was okay. that was a great answer. Over answer everything. And actually on that note of panning, I, I had I'll pull from one of the questions I had about vocals for you. Um background vocals you get stacks i used to get you know left center right for every single part times three or four whatever you got 60 to 100 tracks of background vocals i'm sure you've seen that uh way more times than i have what uh what's your approach for background vocals and panning um are you keeping the left center right that the producer sends you or are you getting rid of the the middle and how what's your approach to panning background vocals um i I can be pretty ruthless on that. I I will immediately mute or inactive or even delete anything I feel is unnecessary. Um, uh, some people even send the room mics of the back row vocals. I'm like, <laughs> the room sounds like crap. Why would I room that? <laughs> I'm sorry for anyone who's done that, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. If they're doing it in a nice hall or something, you know, and you've got a ballad. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I'll, I'll generally, the, the center, uh, I, I'm assuming that you're talking about one pass has a left yeah. center right. Like, yeah. Tenor sopranos and altos, right? Is that what you're talking about, David? Um, so, and then, the end, so like, alto one, three, alto two, alto three, three, and you have a left, center, and right for each part. Exactly. And, yeah. In three passes? And three passes. Yep. Um, of each of each section. Okay. So of what? Each person even. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do first. Yeah. I'll listen to it. There you go. Yes. <laughs> and then I'll decide what is crap and not. So, <laughs> uh, I, okay. This is just a hypothetical. So, so say if they gave you the, you have the altos, mm-hmm. you have three passes, left, center, right, right. So you have yep. nine tracks, but you really only have three. Of altos, right? Um, what I might do is, depending on how it sounds, I may take the left of the first pass, the right of the second pass, and then put the center in the center of the third pass and see how that sounds and see if I need more or less. Okay. Most of the time, I won't need more and that'd be great. I actually, I, in the grand scheme of things, 
I like three passes of something because then you can do a left, center, right. But I want them to actually be three different passes. Yeah, nice. Um, so I may try that. And then, so if you have the same thing for alto, soprano, and tenor, what I might do is I might take the, the center alto and the center soprano and maybe offset them. Oh. So you have a little bit more of a sweeping thing. And tenors generally, because it's they're lower, and lower frequencies have a better center. They're harder to perceive left and right on lower frequencies. Uh, I'll, I may put the tenors more in the center anyways in between the – Oh, okay, the and then build outside of that. I think you told me that over the phone years ago, and I, yeah. that, that stuck with me. Tenors, yeah. and I kind of build it – tenors the baritones and uh or baritones tenors and then let the girls the the ladies take the outsides or the the, the high so, voice so alt sopranos are usually wider yeah alt sopranos i keep I, I mean i really will keep the the whole background perspective pretty wide anything yeah, that sure. in the center will be tucked um because i want that lead vocal to sit right inside of the background um and then what I'll do is, you know, the, the background vocals are one of the very few things I'll actually uh, group and process as a group. Nice. Um, you know, I'll do drums, but that drums is, is a harder explanation of what I do with the drums. But the, sure. the backgrounds, I'll actually subgroup and compress them uh, and, and EQ them as a group. Uh, especially when you've got 40 or 50 or whatever, like you, yeah, yeah. Like you said. So yeah, I'll, uh, that's what I'll do. I really try to, if you can go through a mix and, and decide what's necessary and what's not necessary or what is not as important and eliminate that, that can help you a lot. In Gosh, your- dang it. Now I got to change the hot seat question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, we'll still, I'll ask it uh, here in a minute and we'll, we'll get to it. You just, you said, you know, go through anything that is unnecessary or is, uh, is yeah. Well, uh, gosh, dang it. all right. So next question, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what would be your, uh, so you, I don't know that you sent these often, but, um, I actually prefer it in the, in the gospel world. Um, if you're sent DI electric guitars, Cardinal sin for DI acoustics, even though we have to deal with them sometimes, but uh, DI electric, what would be one of your go-to amp sims for that to recreate that sound? Are you sending it back and saying, Hey, figure out the guitar tone and then send it to me. Or are you going to pull open something and get to work? Uh, you know, I keep, I go through different phases on this. I don't have a pat answer on this. I actually had, um, I actually, my son borrowed it, but I actually had a, um, crap, Vox amp okay. set, up, set up to reamp stuff, uh, for quite a while. And, um, and so if I got a DI thing, uh, I would, I would send it out to that and bring it back in and kind of nice. do it or whatever. Um, it doesn't happen so much anymore. So I've kind of gotten away with that. Um, so if someone sends me a DI, you know, the sand, the funny thing is, it's a sans app, man. The, the thing that that's, uh, you know, stock uh, has been around for years. Yep. Is something I'll, I'll add, and then I'll add to that. I'll add the effects, a McDSP digital delay or something like that. Nice. Uh, but yeah, that, that reminds me once that, that I had to do this, uh, six or seven years ago the guy that played on the live record had this awesome guitar tone because they, they rented the guy, wherever, whatever city they were in, they rented him some incredible amps. Right. But he had to replace like half of his guitar parts because they just weren't right. You know? So he replaced them back at his home in LA or wherever and sent me the DI Oh, okay. And I sent him a message. I'm like, dude, you've got this amazing guitar sound on the live record. Why? Not, I, how am I supposed to like make it sound? Like? He goes, and then he gave me the story. Well, we rented these amps, and I got this great tone, and we—that's what we did for the live record. I'm like, so it's on me to oh, make. No. <laughs> so that's about the time I had that uh, Vox amp, and I would run it through there, and all these effects, and I had pedals. Uh, I had some. 
I gave some of them away to my friends, but I had like all the old MXR pedals and okay, yeah. And stuff. So I don't do that so much anymore. But I haven't had that situation in a long time. It seems like uh, it's getting better. I I know you and I talked years ago about how um, gospel guitar you get some insane musicians, just some of the best in the world, yeah. and then the guitar tones come in and it's like, like, because it, uh, I, 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 don't know, I think we yeah, talked yeah. about it. We both get the, from the, the boss pedal boards that they have, but then sometimes they forget to use the amp or the cab emulations. And so right. you get kind of the crunchy. Uh, yeah. So they, do you still get some of that? Uh, yeah. Well, they aren't, you know, gospel players aren't really known for their power guitar. Sure. Distortion sounds. Um, I want to say there was one plugin I used to, that reminds me, I used to have a, I think it was T-Rex had a pretty cool, I'll have to go back and look it, but that was quite a while ago. Um, was that Amplitude? If it happens nowadays, I whip up either the analog channel on McDSP or the Sans app, and then I'll create something with some other plugins and kind of mash it up. Nice. What about for, for bass? You alluded to Sansamp. Is that a go-to for you on uh, bass if you ever want something a little gritty? It seems like most of the stuff I've heard from you, the, the bass, especially the live stuff, is, is a cleaner bass tone. Are you using the DI for that? or? Yeah. Um, the I don't get – I don't – in the last few years or so, I don't really get as many two bass tracks as you as we used to. Um, used to be a ba- you know, bass DI and then the amp. The like cab, yeah, a big Ampeg amp or something. And when I've tracked bass in the studio, we'll get the big Ampeg and throw an RE20 in front of it or something. Nice. And, um, so, but, but I can't think of a project in the last few years that actually has sent me two bases. So it's usually the DI. And what I'll do is I'll use the analog channel on the mix, mix DSP to give it just a little bit of grit. I don't, it's kind of been was a trend more in the nineties and early two thousands to distort the bass. And it doesn't seem like it's that much anymore. I'm sure it'll come back around, but generally it's now it's just getting the bass to speak and having a lot of uh, booty. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really use that. I uh, use uh, uh, an LA two a a lot. Um, nice. Um, there's as far as, uh, since we're talking about DIs, the yeah. most awesome DI out right now is the fat boy DI. A friend of mine, Brett T garden is, is in longtime engineer, uh, start. And he was also a bass player before that. He started building these tinkering a few years ago in his garage. And he built this two base, uh, DI that is amazing. And I used, I, used to carry it around wherever I went. I even used it in live situations. It would just so change the bass. And even in a live recording or a live front of house situation, I was carrying it around and then I left it at, uh, I left it at a studio in Florida and I keep forgetting that. Oh was, no. Salamina, if you, if you see this, send it to me. <laughs> um, I love, I love, I love the beef knob on the, uh, the eye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Awesome. I mean, it's just night and day. You plug a bass into that thing and you're done. Literally done. So nasty. Uh, you got anybody at bass players out there you might want to pick one of those up. Fat boy. DI. Yeah. Right on. Very nice. Uh, so what about saturation? You alluded to the McDSP. Is that the AC one, right? Analog channel. Yeah, AC one, one or AC two. Yeah. Uh, is that your go-to for distortion or saturation when you need some harmonics, need some, uh, some love to the sterile digital world? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, you know, lately I haven't had much. Um, I don't know what it. I, I you know, the, the these trends kind of go, come and go. You know, mm-hmm. and lately there, people, there really hasn't been much demand to like so, to saturate and distort. Whereas, like I don't know, ten years ago you did it on everything. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, lately I haven't. I haven't really messed around uh, with it too much. You know, I, I try okay. to get things to speak uh, better. Um, there's definitely things like loops and perk and things like that where I'll run through the, the tape 
version of the the McDSP and try to cut down on the transient, but not necessarily change the sound, but just get it louder without actually um, changing the RMS, uh, RMS of the signal. That that nice. Works. Yeah, yeah. Okay, a couple more for you. Uh, what's your favorite compressor plug-in? Just general use compressor plug-in. Well, gosh, my, well, <laughs> the one I use a lot is, or two or three, is the MIG DSP uh, Ultimate Compressor where you can pick from the Fairchild, the... Like their 500 series, right? It's got the little modules. The Fairchild, the uh, Veramu, the Neve, the... That's my go-to one. Nice. But I'll tell you what, my favorite compressor and fascinating, I don't get to use it as much as I want, is the Eventide Omnipressor. Okay. You to get it from Eventide. And I remember this thing you know from when i used to actually work in a studio uh when i was younger this compressor is awesome for vocals guitars anything that you want to keep in a really steady level because what it does is you set the threshold you set the gain and the attenuator and as the signal goes above or below the threshold it'll gain it or uh reduce the gain it's nice. amazing. It, it's something that Queen used a lot um, on their records, the, the Eventide Omnipressor. It's an awesome thing, and not a lot of people talk about it, but it, it could be something that a young engineer could use. Uh, and, and if he got used pretty to quick. using it, he could use it on a lot of things. It, it's pretty amazing. Nice. I think, is it, uh, Joey, am I right that uh, Metric Halo have a – an emulation of that. I don't know if we lost Joey there for a second. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. my phone. I'm sorry. The, the does Metric Halo? They have an emulation of that, don't they? The Omnipressor. No, they don't. No, it's just even no. tied. Okay, it's even. It's even tied. Yeah. I yeah. think it must be some with the copyright or something. Uh, but it, it's it's really worth looking up. I mean, it's it's right a, it's, it's it's a great compressor. Absolutely. Yeah. It's un ridiculous. You used and, to use the hardware all the time. Yeah. And you know the funny thing, uh, okay, another side story. Sorry, I have all these sides. Let's do it, man. And I'm actually really an introvert, so it's kind of weird that I'm <laughs> talking like this. But w when I switched the Pro to started mixing more and more Pro Tools in the early 2000s, and I was really still skeptical. I mean, I, I kind of went there because of necessity. a and our guys were wanting recalls. They wanted things faster. Um, they didn't really care about you know, tape and analog sure. and crap. They just wanted recalls, recalls, recalls. And um, so people started coming out with emulations of gear and stuff. And and Joey, you're gonna you're gonna know what I'm talking about. Um, somebody came out at that time. I can't remember who who got the license or they came out with a version of the Harmonizer nine ten. And there was this trick that we used in the eighties where the pitch you would stick a guitar into it you would put the you would press one or two buttons and you make the little knob jiggle so it would fluctuate the pitch just a little yeah. bit and then you would take the other side and you would pan it l l right you'd have the original guitar left and the the uh the guitar from the harmonizer on the right and it would explode this stereo image Nice. So I got this plug-in to try out. I don't know. This might have been 2001, 2003. And I'm like, okay, this is going to make or break my opinion of Pro Tools and all this digital stuff. So I tried it, and I, I did it, and it did exactly what the hardware piece did. That's and awesome. Like, this is awesome. Like, <laughs> yes. And there was no noise. Like the 1176 always had noise, but when they made the plug-in, they took out the noise. <laughs> so talk, talking about talking about, I'm sorry to deviate from this a little bit. What is your favorite 1176 plugin? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> ah, you know, because we have iterations of, you know, we have waves, I, we have universal I mean, audio. Yeah. Bomb in, general, factory. in general, I think universal audio is got those, all those emulations pretty slam. I mean, yeah. you if you're going to try, if you're going to argue about, is the universal art audio one better than, you know, the way yeah. I think 
you've missed the point. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> yeah, I, I mentioned uh, before we went live recording that uh, I was watching some interviews with uh, Andrew Sheps, and he talked about how he recently had a mix where he he takes a lot of uh, uh, he he takes the clients, the producer, the artist session, and he just continues on from where they left off. He doesn't strip everything down and start over. He he just kind of takes and, and finishes it. And he alluded to how they had a Bomb Factory 1176 on the vocal and then they had a Wave 76 on another one. And, uh, you know, my thought would be, oh, well, let me swap out that Bomb Factory for the UAD or whatever. And uh, he said when he did that, uh, he's a, and he loves the UAD stuff, he said uh, it was exactly what the vocal didn't need. The Bomb Factory was cleaner and did what that particular vocal needed. Right. Yeah. So not necessarily better, just different. And uh, so, uh, and actually I was doing a shootout with the UAD distressor and the slate distressor. I may be wrong. My ears may have been tired, but the UA felt definitely more like the hardware in the sense of just a little bit of that oomph or, or uh, I want to say grit, subtle grit, not, not a huge difference, but the slate, uh, Steven Slate's version was a little, felt a little smackier, a little brighter even, and maybe gain staging, maybe input signal, whatever. But I could totally see how when going for one or the other, one or the other may be what you want. Right. And so instead of overthinking it to just kind of, you know, use it. And if it's giving you what you want, if it's coming out of the speakers the way you want it to hear or you want it to sound, rock it and move on. Yeah. But, uh, which, which leads me to reminds me of something David Foster says to people he works with is that the, the mix you don't send them, they'll never hear. Mm. So it, the, whatever the mix is that you do and you send it, that's what the people are going to hear. Like they don't care if you did 117 six or a fair child, that is it. They'll, they're going to like what you send them. And, Correct. uh, so we know all these options we have available and it's up to you to decide as a mix engineer, what is the right, what is the right option you feel is good for you and what you like and what your ears are hearing. And then you send that, they're not going to hear the other version that you think, Oh, well, we should have used a lexicon 480 instead of a sure. AKG spring reverb that nobody gives a, the, the consumer doesn't care about that. They At want all. to make them feel good. So correct. My That's two awesome, man. Good stuff. He yeah. just gave me the uh, the intro to the show. I'm going to take that quote and put that. You're going to start the show off for us. <laughs> We've uh, Man, we're having a great time talking music. Uh, I know we could go for a lot longer, but we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to segue into the hot seat here. Uh -oh. This is uh, a segment that uh, I'm going to toss out a scenario. Could be mixing, recording, whatever. And uh, I'm going to put you in, in a, a tough situation and you're going to have to mix your way out of it. Uh, for today, for you, because you have such a niche in the live album world, um, I want you to picture you've got a producer, they've sent you uh, the tracks, they've gone after the event, so you got the, whether it's Danny Duncan or whoever has recorded this live, and then the producer's going to go behind the scenes, and now, let's picture maybe an, an up-and-coming or an inexperienced producer, not your Aaron Lindsay's or, or whatnot, and they've gone and they've layered in Logic, key part after key part after, you know, strings and colors and all of these layers, um, you've got an overloaded arrangement. It's a chaotic mess. How are you going to handle that quote unquote overproduced sound? Uh, okay. And so what, what, what is our end game? Is it, is it, what is the artist? Uh, I guess, what is the end game? Is it supposed to be open and live black? Yeah so, yeah. so picture, uh, one of your best live albums and they've come to you and they've said, Hey, I, I love your sound. I love what you did on Israel. You know, I, I'd love to have that. Here's all my color. Here's all my parts. And so you're going to kind of help them along. Or are you going to, how are you going to handle the communication or how you handle it in the mix? Well, what, what I would probably do is I'd go with, I'd go with, you know, my gut feeling, like I'd play the session. Like I said, I listen mm -hmm. to it, go with my gut. And then, uh, so we're saying like, if it's a black gospel thing, we're yep. going to, we're going to get the jump drum slam and, and we're going to get whatever is rhythmic and giving us a beat, the guitars that are chinking or whatever in the piano. Those are the things that like really drive that type of a mix and get the vocals in there and then layer in whatever the keyboards part. So it sounds like this guy layered a bunch of, you know, 
ethereal pads and stuff like that. So what I might do is come up with a, a, a blend where that's just in the background and we still have the general mix of what I would do and see, see where he takes the first ref right. um, and, and see what, he, what, what feedback I get from them for the first ref. And, and if they come back and say, yeah, that's great, then cool, we're done. Or they say, man, I really want to hear this part uh, that, I, that I did, you know. Nice. And so we'll, I may mess around with a, another version of two um, and see if I can make a compromise of getting that extra junk into the mix. Uh, and and if, if that doesn't work, then I may have to say, hey, man, you're, you're, you're – you came to me for this. You want it to slam. You want the drum slam. You want the vocals out front. You want the rhythm part of the thing. But you've got all this keyboard stuff that you've added that wasn't there that night. Or some, and kind of, you're going to kind of have to talk them down off the edge. And depending on how they react to that, you're going to know, uh, crap, uh, is my, am I going to have to fire myself? <laughs> <laughs> Or uh, if you can maybe find a way uh, um, to make a compromise. Now, here, here's something I'll interject here. Yeah, if, man. If, this, if it's a new client, and this is an advice for younger guys or whatever, if it's a new client, you're always going to want to go more than the extra mile anyways because you're starting a relationship. And, and, I, and when I was younger, I didn't think of this uh, very often. I always – was always thinking of the project I was working on and the next project I was working on. But if you can think that every person that you work for could be somebody that you work for again and again the next 10 or 20 years, then some of these come, things come into more perspective, right? Like we get really upset when they give us a task that seems insurmountable mm -hmm. when you're doing it in just this project. And we want to like tell them they're crazy. No, this doesn't need to be in the mix. Let's mute this, whatever. But if you can find, if this is a new client and you're finding that you can maybe get to a compromise and maybe be a little more full service to them, this may somewhat be someone that may hire you five or six ten, times in the next 10 years. And if you can keep that perspective in your head and keep your cool, you know, don't, you know, start getting going crazy and saying you're nuts or whatever. This thing gonna work, and you can think of your long term project projection. So, you know, maybe this is a five thousand dollar project or a ten thousand dollar project. Well, think this may affect five or six more of those down the road. So this may be a fifty thousand dollar relationship you're cultivating. Mm -hmm. um, and so I might, in my age now, I may go down a little further than I would have when I was younger. And when I was younger, I'd be like, uh, screw you. This, <laughs> sucks. you know, uh, I can't make this work. That so, is seriously, I, I that's, that's a really long answer to that. No, question. that is, that's my favorite part of this whole, this whole talk. I wish I would have heard that, uh, 10 years ago because yeah, it'd probably be a hundred, $150,000 more yeah. in the bank at this yeah. uh, point. You got to think about the long term part of your career, every project you do. And if you do that, things get easier. You get less of those things where you have to fire yourself. You get less of those things where you don't know what to do. And like, so you mentioned Aaron Lindsay. So when we, we worked together so long, um, gosh, it's probably like 20 years now. Um, so when he sends me something, I pretty much know what he wants. Like I literally, we know each other. Yeah, and so it makes things easier. But there was a time when we first worked together that it wasn't like that. So, if you view every new relationship as something that could be grow that can grow down the road, um, that might help you in keeping your temper when you're putting way too many hours into a project. Now, you know what I'm saying, or or encourage. So maybe not. Maybe it's not temper as much as it is encouraging not to be lazy or to put in more effort to invest yeah. in the long term, like you said, and not. Yeah. you know, the here and now I'm hungry. I want to go to dinner. Like, Hey, let's, let's respect their creative vision and try to make it work to build that relationship for the future. And that, that to me is one of the most valuable things you said that, uh, <laughs> I'm smacking well, myself. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what, what, there's something to relate to that, a story I have that relates to that really. Yeah, please. Uh, dramatically. I was tracking something, 
in it might have been ninety six or ninety seven and 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 i had i probably had one or two Grammys by then, so I started to gra- i i may have been getting a little bit of an attitude i don't know, but I was tracking for Alain Millet. It was a at the time a very hot French producer he was produced the story Jonathan Brook and a bunch of uh, Latin jazz and stuff nice. in the nineties and I was tracking a record for him at Woodland B or Woodland A. And we literally were working 12, 14, 16 hour days. And it was like four or five days straight. And I was kind of getting that. I was kind of becoming grumpy mm. and uh, into the third day or whatever. And in, in Nashville, everybody's generally pretty nice and they would rather be nice to you than actually give you a good constructive criticism or a beat down that would really help you. A lot of times in Nashville, they'll say, oh, yeah, no, that's awesome. You're great, whatever. And as soon as they walk out the door, they never call you again. Oh, yeah. It happens a lot. So Alon actually, after, I don't know, it might have been the third third or fourth day, we had already worked 40, 50 hours in three days. And and I was tired. I was grumpy. I was kind of complaining. I was starting to kind of, in his opinion, I was starting to vibe the session, right? So he took me out. We went out in the kitchen, and he goes, hey, man, I really like you, but you're being an ass. No. (laughs) uh, I can get anybody else in here to record this record if you don't change your attitude. He goes, I want you on board for this record. And and he says, are you up to it? You know, are you you doing it? We're going to work. We're going to work 16 and 18 hours a day the next week. We got to get this stuff done. And so, I mean, I was like, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, man, I'm sorry. I'll change my attitude or whatever. So I, I, I like, he, he kicked me in the ass. Yeah. And I got back into the studio and I changed my attitude and I got into it. And later on when they actually, um, the, the, I actually, uh, every song, I would move the drum mics like we were talking about earlier. Later on, when he was mixing the record with Michael Bauer, uh, which he's big time, they called me from the mix. They were drunk. They were like, this, this, Trace, you know, I know I was bitching about moving microphones and everything. This sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Awesome it was. And the thing was, he took the time to like say, hey, man, you're at a cross point here. Like, change your attitude and, and, uh, and or I'm going to get somebody else to do it. And I changed my attitude. And what happened was we had a, a you know, I was ready to quit. Like, I mean, he'd worked me to death, whatever. And he changed my attitude. And we end up doing a bunch of records over the course of the next three or four years that I really loved. Oh, that's amazing. And so, yeah, he worked to be to death, and, but we, amazing things came out of it. And so you kind of have to change your attitude when it comes to those things. And it's not something I like to hear a lot because there is a part of me that is lazy. Um, but if you, can look, if you can look at every project that you work on as something that potentially may be five or six more projects, then your attitude, it helps you change your attitude and work harder on the whatever you're working on at that time. I'll That's amazing. Yeah. Incredible advice. Yeah. Dang it, man. Salvo, you are a beast. I uh I'm already thinking we gotta get you back for uh for mixing in a workshop. We gotta talk recording and I know you've produced a lot of stuff. How many uh in the last several years have you been able to to get out there and, and produce as much as you'd like to or uh I would you know producing is a lot of compared to mixing, producing is a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, for in a ratio of maybe not as much money as you get. Mixed. The business side, yeah, for sure. Uh, because you spend a lot of time uh, doing stuff. Uh, so I've, I produced a few things over the last couple of years, but um, I think I might produce more. I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I enjoy it with the right people. Um, I generally like working with people that are incredibly musically talented, and they may – they don't have the um, 
maybe the nuts and bolts of producing a record themselves mm. and I can come alongside and co-produce with them. I, I enjoy nice. that. The last record I produced, uh, Jen Bostic, um, she's just amazingly talented musically, and, but, and she should very well produce her own records in the future, but at this time, did, didn't have that extra uh, sure. management. and Because really when you produce a record, you're managing what everything's going on. You gotta keep track of everything. You gotta make sure everybody's doing their job and you're going in the right overall direction. So. I, I do enjoy that. I did enjoy that. And, and, and I got to hire myself to actually track. So I tracked the record. <laughs> there you go. I missed tracking records, and so it was a lot of fun. Right on. Awesome. Well, Joey, do you have uh, any last-second questions for the man, the legend? Uh, you know what? Um, we'll, get, we'll, we'll continue this, absolutely, yeah. because uh, my questions are more technical stuff, but I'd rather do this you know, in the proper, at the proper time. Right on, man. Well, Salvo, dude, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been a long time coming to, uh, to be able to sit down and hang out. And it uh, sounds like we're going to uh, try to try to build on that relationship and see if we can uh, maybe get a course or two out of you and yeah. workshops in the future and, and see where, where it goes, man. The sky's the limit. I know there's a lot of people who, uh, who are you know, fans of, of your work that uh, would pay good money, man. I know you guys out there, you're like, give me your, give me, uh, you ready to toss some money to, uh, to <laughs> I, I certainly would. Uh, they're going to be surprised at how simple some of the techniques are. So hey man, less is more sometimes. Hey, less is more, man. Sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. Unless it's not, but you know, <laughs> 10 plugins on one track, zero on another. Unless you have like 50 keyboard tracks and a hundred loops and <laughs> PC loops. <laughs> well, more only works with money, right? Less money. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Funny. Well, guys, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Salvo. Where can they find you if they want to get in touch? Want to uh, check out your work? We mentioned some uh, some of your credits at the beginning, but uh, I know you're on Instagram. What's your Instagram yeah, handle? Paul Salvison and Facebook Paul Salvison and Wikipedia Paul Salvison. Uh, and my website is salvomix.com, which we're updating as we speak. Um, but if you want to hit me up, uh, Salvo at Salvo Mix is my email. Right on, man. Well, we'll put links to that in the description below. And uh, thanks for guys for checking it out. If you guys want to submit questions for Salvo for maybe a future interview, uh, hit me. I'll put my links in the description as well so that we can uh, get those ready and we'll fire away whenever uh, we can pin them down again. So. Well, dang it, man. Hey, God bless you, your family, everything. We appreciate you coming on and uh, look forward to hanging out again soon. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We'll see you, Joey. See you. You got it, buddy.